Um, so a couple of years ago, I read, actually, like, I don't know, 15 years ago, I read a study that said that when women speak in public, they are much more likely to apologize for what they're about to say than men are. So in keeping with that time-honored tradition, um, uh, I'm very sorry for what's about to happen. Uh, but I, I was at another conference, and I was kidnapped by a group of academic terrorists, a small group that calls themselves the culture, and uh, and they've been holding me hostage ever since. So one, I'm sorry, and two, it's not my fault. <laughs> Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> no, seriously, I'm I'm uh, I work in environmental philosophy and in animal studies, and I have absolutely no business at a sound studies conference talking about sound to sound studies experts like yourselves. Um, but they insisted that I had to come here and I had to meet you. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> All right. Wait, that was an apology. You thanked us. That wasn't? You sent, thanked us. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> see, you, you see what this is? Already. You see what's happened. All right. Okay, so that dolphins and other cetaceans communicate is considered common knowledge. Bioacoustics has uncovered the richness and complexity of cetacean sounds and illuminated their central role in cetacean social organization. But this is the type of communication that Willem Plusser has called natural, whether oral like bird song or gestural like the waggle dance of bees. Natural communication simply conveys information necessary for survival. <clears throat> in contrast, the unnatural or cultural communication of humans is, quote, perverse because it wants to store the information it acquires. Contemporary dolphin research asks not if dolphins communicate, but if they converse like we do, learning from each other, storing information, resisting entropy. Does communication make the world of dolphins increasingly complex? Unlike previous attempts to answer this question, all of which were experiments on dolphins in captivity, marine biologist Denise Herzing is attempting to unlock the secrets of dolphin communication, and in fact, to communicate with them in the wild. She has teamed up with engineer Tad Starner to create the chat box, which records actual dolphin whistles and then plays them underwater in the proximity of objects. The hope is to create in the dolphin a referential sound for object association by means of repetition, in the same way one teaches a child to speak. The device broadcasts sounds, which Herzing wants her dolphins to associate with different common objects. Herzing and Starner hope at some point to have a chat box with all the fundamental units of dolphin sound in it. They hope, furthermore, to crack the dolphin code by means of pattern recognition software, an algorithm that identifies strings of units in what sounds to the human ear like a cacophony. Chat is essentially a smart device focused on dolphin sounds and behaviors. National Geographic calls Herzing a veritable Jane Goodall of the sea, <laughs> inviting comparisons between dolphins and our hominid cousins, chimps. While Goodall's ethological research on chimps in the wild indeed revolutionized primatology, it is not her work, but the great ape sign language experiments of the 1970s that Herzing's dolphin research recalls. Although the project is orally based, Herzing herself falls back into the sign language paradigm when discussing the process of dolphins learning chat. Quote, once they get it, like Helen Keller getting language, we think it's going to go very rapidly. End of quote. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> the slip is interesting. Just as teaching chimps and gorillas to sign turned the focus away from both human and ape voices to sign language, our present attempts to communicate with dolphins have also led to a non-vocal technology. Turning towards chimps and gorillas, we became an exaggeration of the creature we already were, loosely speaking, namely a creature with hands. Turning towards dolphins, we have become an exaggeration of a different kind of creature, a creature with an underwater smart device. <laughs> now, whether or not being attached to a smart device is our new natural state, morphologically speaking, it is not by accident that Herzing's partner in the creation of the chat box, Tad Starner, happens to also be the creator of Google Glass. <laughs> yeah, you'd like to unhear that, but you can't. 
In both cases of the most ambitious programs of research into interspecies communication to date, the fact that humans are vocalizing animals has receded into the background. With apes, the switch to hands was to be expected, given the bodily morphology we share with other primates, and that apes in the wild use gestural communication with each other at least as much as vocalizing. Dolphins, however, are morphologically distant from us, evolutionarily related to hoofed animals like deer and cattle, the hippo being their closest land relative. And yet, for all the emphasis on difference, dolphins are commonly considered the marine counterpart to humans, the other most complicated animal, the sapiens of the sea. While primate researchers post, sorry, while primate researchers posit a shared pre-linguistic ability between humans and chimpanzees, dating back to a common ancestor, dolphin researchers stress similarities not in linguistic ability, but in intelligence, underlying language acquisition. Faith in this intelligence is grounded in large part in the very things cetaceans have in common with humans, their vocalizing. Perhaps no other animal sound on the planet has a comparably powerful effect on the contemporary environmental imagination. It is the source of our belief that dolphins, like humans, are conversational creatures, with adjectives like garrulous and inquisitive popping up all over the scientific literature with no one blinking an eye or screaming anthropomorphism. The intelligence claim is tied to the claim about complex social life, which in turn is tied to the belief that, su that such creatures must surely talk amongst themselves. John Durham Peters' extraordinary study of cetaceans and the ocean as medium in his book, The Marvelous Clouds, focuses on what he calls their acoustic intelligence. That they have society in the absence of physical infrastructure causes him to speculate that their social organization happens entirely on the level of hearing one another speak. Quote, humans learn to build ships, track stars, and write programs. And perhaps dolphins, having nothing better to do with their large brains, learn to pluck single voices out of the pitchy tangle of high frequency noise. If they built an ocean wide web, it would have no archive but their collective brains, and no search engines but their sonar, end quote. We never imagine a lone introverted dolphin swimming along brutally and having deep thoughts in silence, <laughs> which of course is one reason that the world's loneliest whale is so fascinating. Um, and something I learned recently is that uh, scientists who work on the, on the world's loneliest whale stuff uh, have been contacted by, uh, by deaf activism groups, deafness activism groups, and, uh, and have been t informed that the whale is obviously deaf, right? So there's an interesting conversation there. And I will return to deafness, actually. <coughs> this was not the starting assumption behind this, was not the starting assumption behind teaching signs to other primates. We hoped to get to speak with them, but not because of what we imagined them to be doing amongst themselves when we weren't looking. It's thus remarkable that we abandoned the work with apes when they failed to use the signs creatively and spontaneously like human children do. Given that we did not suspect apes of conversing with each other, it is remarkable that we never questioned the assumption that they would converse with us. The apes got it, but certainly not like Helen Keller. <laughs> Several of the sign language experiments were considered successful, but regardless, the entire enterprise was ultimately discarded in the course of the case of the chimpanzee Nim Chimpsky, whose keeper and observer, Dr. Herbert Terrace, concluded that apes were merely mimicking signs in order to please their trainers, not using them in the way that would count as language. Even in the most successful cases, the apes failed to ask questions of the humans. Terrace stated that, this, that his motivation behind teaching Nim to sign was, quote, to find out what the world looks like from a chimpanzee's point of view. But the apes never seemed invested in this project, and the funding was pulled. <laughs> Having no doubt learned from the ostensibly failed ape sign language experiments, the project of two-way communication with dolphins is a bit less ambitious in its goals. But it does bank on the productive intersection of two well-documented capacities of dolphins, which incidentally are not nearly as present in apes. Curiosity and vocalizing. It is thus remarkable, then, that the chat box seems to foreclose both of these. The dolphins do not interact with humans as fellow vocalizers. They will vocalize during the exchange, but we will not. 
Furthermore, in the chat universe, meaning is reduced to direct correspondence between sounds and the things to which they refer, and all of the aspects of hearing one another speak that exceed simple semiosis are marginalized. In other words, everything potentially interesting in the encounter is left out of the sphere of meaning making. Now, if dolphin social life is as heavily lubricated by conversation as we imagine, if theirs is a subjectivity unusually ravenous for novel and complex stimuli, and an intersubjectivity so authentically interattuned, why would this mundane, superficial interaction catch and hold their interest? Why should they care? Now, as a strictly empirical claim, my position is problematic at best. My working hypothesis bored dolphins <laughs> probably sounds like something out of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But I ask for your patience in helping me formulate what I think is a set of serious questions which go something like this. Should scientists continue to assume the curiosity of cetaceans about humans as humans become increasingly uninteresting to and disinterested in each other? <laughs> Shouldn't today's interspecies communication projects take into account crises of meaning in the human sphere? As we work to enter into society with dolphins, should we not attend to our own breakdown of the social? Why would intelligent, interested creatures want to talk to creatures that speak to each other without saying anything? Now, a playful reversal might look like this. As you can see there, <laughs> there's a very uh, bored dolphin researcher who's fallen asleep and the dolphin won't shut the fuck up. <laughs> In his essay called Interesting, Leotard announces that, quote, nothing is less interesting than what passes for conversation these days. Bergson said, this is Leotard, Bergson said, Conversation is conservation. The same goes for the majority of interviews, discussions, dialogues, roundtables, debates, colloquia, <clears throat> for which our world has such an appetite. They serve to assure that we are indeed on the same wavelength and that it's going okay. Nothing is less interesting. The only interesting thing is to try to speak the language of another that you don't understand." End of quote. The languages one doesn't understand should be understood as broadly as possible, including, and these are Leotard's examples, physical effects, cosmic phenomena, recurrent lapses, the color of a landscape, the chromaticism of a string quartet, and even, or perhaps most importantly, sentences and words in our language, the one we imagine we understand. Leotard writes, the said keeps the unsaid in reserve. What is What the interesting is, is in rendering that unsaid sayable. The chat box serves precisely the opposite goal, namely to eliminate anything that exceeds the said or that the said keeps in reserve. This is clearly true of the second stage of chat, the one receiving much less media coverage than the pre-recorded whistles, namely Starner's pattern recognition software. The technology Starner uses to study dolphins is something he plans to apply to human activity, surprise, in hopes of finally making the, every last aspect of life intelligible. Here's a quote from the new scientist. He thinks pattern recognition software can discover the signature of any activity, from brushing your teeth to commuting to work. He wants to create wearable computers that learn what the wearer is doing. Here's a quote from Starner. Imagine having sensors on your wrist, and as you go through daily life, it could figure out what paging through a book is, opening the car door. All these things are unique gestures. Put together, they are scripts. In other words, the cacophony Starner wishes to decode is that of life itself. Don't be fooled by the recent disappearance of Google Glass. As MIT Technology Review reports, we are only in the beginning stages of pattern recognition technology, which will become at the center of our lives, serving as, quote, a memory aid and productivity enhancer. The goal is life, <coughs> excuse me, the goal is life becomes script, completely exhaustively predictable, learnable by computers in the form of smartphones, smart glasses, smart watches, smart dust, and who knows what other smart thing will soon accompany everyday life. In a world in which, as Leotard puts it, quote, everything that is to be done is as if it were already done, or as William Gaddis wrote in his final novel, everything is equal to everything else, 
What remains to be curious about? Even crisis has become ordinary, as we learn from Lauren Berlant, who, wrote that, who writes that crisis is no longer an event, but an environment. This is the character of the present environmental crisis, in which single catastrophes, which once signified much more powerfully in their own right, have been reduced to mere symptoms of more general and totalizing conditions, like climate change and what conservationists call collapse. Sustainability has become about optimistically sustaining something that is unlivable in the first place, and what today passes for wellness answers to first world late capitalist values. I've written elsewhere about interspecies relations and conditions of what I call, what I call our generalized captivity, a sort of claustrophobic ontology of toxins and noise, um, and I have a lot more to say uh, there and, and uh, in later conversation about Haraway's notion of contact zones contact with animals in conditions of proximity and what she calls permanent complexity. Um, hers is a sort of 21st century reputation of the late 20th century wilderness ethic of non-interference. Uh, here's my quick and dirty on late Haraway. While it is still true that hell is other people, it is perhaps less true that there is no exit. The exit is also other people and the people are animals. <laughs> but as as Haraway-an, uh, and, or perhaps cyber-feminist, as the triad of dolphin, computer, human initially appears, chat is actually the opposite of a contact zone. To approach interspecies communication with smart device technology is to forget the role of this technology in our own atrophying of the social. The fact that dolphins vocalize, and that this matters to us, is an opportunity to revisit the value of listening in interspecies communication projects specifically, but also in ethics and critical theory more generally. We are still very entrenched in a metaphysics of voice that links vocalizing to the making of claims. Stephen Fogel's critique um, of the idea that nature speaks, for example, um, concludes with the claim that because non-human entities cannot engage in the kind of dialogue in which humans engage in order to determine how we ought to live, the usual linkages between language use and ethics do not apply and we must divorce moral considerability from the capacity to speak. Here's Fogel, quote, until such entities are capable of making and defending claims, we humans have no choice but to raise and, dis and discuss claims about them ourselves, because, not because we prefer to think we're at the center of the moral world, but because we seem to be the only ones talking here and don't know how to figure out what's true without talking, end of quote. But the conflation of talking and claiming forgets the dimension of acoustic intelligence that emerges as we look and listen more closely to marine mammals. Could we become more acoustically intelligent? And what would this mean for ethics? We haven't begun to explore Leotard's claim that reading is a listening, for example, and that writing is actually a form of reading the other and me, which is a form of listening. Everything interesting in writing, even or especially in theoretical writing, escapes bibliometrics and instead chases the unsaid. In Gaddis's final novel, Agape Agape, an old man on his deathbed, presumably Gaddis himself, rants about automation and its complex, of, complex effects on Western art and civilization. The rant begins with the history of the player piano, but ends, surprisingly, not with a by now predictable critique of machines and a champion of the human spirit, but with issues of voice and ventriloquism. As he nears death, the old man shakes his fist at Svengali, the fictional hypnotist who turned his tone-deaf laundress, Trilby, into the world's greatest opera singer, the most beautiful voice ever heard, in order to capitalize on her without her knowledge. The agonized protagonist's dying wish is to find and avenge himself on his private Svengali, to identify and expose the process that has resulted in his becoming, quote, a non-person looking back at the arrogant, self-made self. The figure of techno-capitalism for Gaddis is ventrilo ventriloquism by hypnosis, which exploits our collective tone deafness and packs our open mouths with voices and contents which are not only not our own, which would be one thing, but those of the systems and structures of dominance and exploitation, which is another thing altogether. Gaddis knows very well that the self to which he longs to be restored doesn't exist, and probably never did. To borrow a favorite term of Dominic Petman's, there's no there there. And self, 
becomes nothing more than the capacity to listen. And here's where I'm getting very nervous because I remember Eleni talking about we become a giant ear. Oh no. But this is not nothing. We have here an opportunity to rethink the value of listening for environmentalism, but in terms very different than those of soundscape restoration. As Petman reminds us in his soon to be published manuscript, Sonic Intimacy, voice is never my own. And, and my speaking is a mere conduit for the unsayable that reverberates throughout the world. Quote, the ecological voice is thus not a property of a subject, but a refrain passed between beings, he writes, urging us to learn how to listen to what he calls the vox mundi. Taking dolphins as fellow vocalizers and thus as fellow listeners might be an opportunity for new connections between environmentalism and sound beyond soundscapes, literally speaking. Petman calls on us Quote, to recalibrate our relationship with our own ears, to truly listen to something as it is disappearing, since everything is disappearing, becoming an object of loss, like the omnimaternal amniotic envelope we have escaped or been exiled from, end of quote. If hearing is an ability or capacity, perhaps listening is better figured as disability, incapacity, to bring this all back to Helen Keller, or a bit more exactly to critical disability studies, which remind us that there is no original hearing body to which to restore the deaf body, and that listening takes many forms. What would it mean to think of ecological listening as a relationship to environmental loss? Not as a restoration project of the type that soundscape ecology offers in its effort to combat or deny loss, but a deliberate turning toward loss since everything is disappearing. So in conclusion, I call for an acoustic ethics no, not really. Um, stepping back from, from that a bit, right? Uh, perhaps we could take a step back and say something a little bit more modest, like where John Durham Peters leaves us with marine mammals' acoustic intelligence, intelligence, we might begin to explore an acoustic ethics inside environmental thought, or ways of being animals and being with animals, both human and not, that show that acoustic intelligence is always an ethical matter. And if that's saying too much, Perhaps we can take another step back and say that at least, even when moral considerability is divorced from the capacity for dialogue, ethics is actually never divorced from listening. And if that's saying too much, <laughs> perhaps we can take another step back and at least consider the place of the interesting in moral considerability. The interesting, or that thing that makes us listen up in the first place. Thank you.